Great. Well, um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to present here today. I am going to diverge a little bit from the topic of environmental health, but I hope you see the linkages as I go through, through the talk about biomarker discovery. I um, also want to apologize to everybody today that I have to take off uh, this afternoon because I have a son that's graduating from high school tomorrow, and that's an important thing to celebrate for the milestone. Yes. So first I wanted to start off with a description and kind of a definition of biomarkers because a lot of people think about biomarkers in a little bit different way. So we characterize biomarkers as measurable indicators of the presence or severity of disease or infection or even exposure. Um, often these are identified as biological molecules that coincide with clinical symptoms or endpoints which themselves are surrogates of disease. Um, but validation is extremely time consuming and expensive. And so if you think about the biomarker discovery and validation process, there are a lot of different components of that that are heavily reliant on the computational or mathematical method that are used to identify them in terms of thinking about redundancy, um, areas of um, reproducibility across populations or even uncertainty in their identification. So I was asked to talk about what some of the challenges are with big data and machine learning for biomarker discovery. Um, one of the biggest ones that we face is that um, the data complexity and diversity is very, very large. So we've heard a couple of speakers this morning talk about genomics data sets, metabolomics data sets, the different measurement technologies, and some of the uncertainties. But if you think about the flow of biological information from DNA to RNA to proteins, and then post-translational modifications, metabolites and lipids, all of these different biomolecules measure different components of the physiological response to um, their insult or an infection, and then are going to manifest into a disease state. Um, Typically, we think of, of the phenotype or the function really being characterized by changes in metabolic levels of small molecules or lipids that, and proteins that carry out the molecular function within a cell. Um, but these are also influenced very heavily by a person's genetics. They're influenced by their environment, so not just the area they live in, but their diet um, and exercise, their stress. Um, and then the metagenome that we talked about this morning in terms of the microbiome. And so there are a lot of different components that influence the steady state levels of these molecules in an individual. Um, the other challenge for biomarker discovery is, is the disparity and differences in quality of these data types. And again, that was also mentioned this morning where, you know, genomics and genome sequencing technologies have advanced to be um, much better, much more quantitative than they used to be. Even proteomics in the past 15 years has made very big strides in being more quantitative, better understanding of the peptides that we identify, how we quantify peptides, and how we translate that into um, changes in pools of biological molecules within a cell. But the nascent technologies for metabolite measurements and lipid measurements really haven't gotten there yet. and so. Um, as we think about the measurement of these, tech, these molecules, mostly we rely on technologies like GCMS and LCMS that have databases where you can reference everything to a known chemical, maybe you can reference it to a, a concentration, but ultimately what we'd like to be able to do with the exposome is to be able to measure everything and not just measure all the stuff we know should be there, but be able to figure out the stuff that's there that maybe shouldn't be there or is some kind of xenobiotic or a transformation product. And so that really will push the next generation of these technologies um, to, to have much more breadth of, of coverage. But again, disparity in the quality of that data, which will have to evolve over time. And then, you know, the other big challenge is the scale of the data that we collect. So we used to think about sequencing data and microarray data as being big data about 20 years ago. But now that we have these new technologies with the high resolution mass spectrometers, the imaging technologies where we're actually able to do imaging mass spec analyses on tissue samples, 
um, terabytes of data that are generated, you know, in days or weeks for a given experiment. And so the size of that data combined with the computation that needs to happen and, as you also heard this morning, the complexity of the biology that needs to be considered from an expert-informed um, analysis is, is really a big challenge. And then there's the system's complexity. You know, if we think about one biological fluid or tissue that we measure these things in, it's a snapshot of what's happening in that tissue, and it doesn't necessarily represent the whole physiology. So what we're really talking about is a multi-scale problem going from genes and molecules to networks, cells, tissues, and the whole physiology of an individual combined with their microbiome and their genetics and everything else that's going on. And so it is, it is really a big, a big data challenge. So for the machine learning on these data sets, some of the big challenges we face um, is around the data structure. Is it discrete data? Is it continuous data? A lot of these data types are qualitative. They're actually not um, quantitative from a concentration identification perspective. There may be low or high dimensionality in these data, and a lot of nonlinear relationships, as we heard about this morning. And so um, we have to consider that different machine learning algorithms are going to work better or worse on different data sets that we have. Um, complete data is also a huge challenge. So for the mass spectrometry capabilities where we measure molecules, we don't always measure the same molecules in every single sample we analyze. And that's not because they're not there. It's because there is a random chance of not identifying it based on the identification probability or the algorithm that you apply, how much um, uncertainty is built into that algorithm. And so when you think about data imputation for some of these data types in order to apply a machine learning approach, you actually have to consider that there are multiple reasons why data may be missing. Um, we know that there are known dependencies in the data, so things like the chemistry of the molecules that are identified, how well they fly through a mass spectrometer, what kind of separation technology was used in order to um, to get them into the instrument. So there are dependencies just within the chemistry of what's identified for how well it's identified or how poorly it's identified. Um, and then model interpretation. So we've, we've experienced a lot of biomarker discovery over the past 15 years where statistically we identify features that are predictive for a disease. We identify a molecule that's never been described before. We try to create an assay and then it all falls apart. And it's partly because maybe there's not the reproducibility, maybe there's the population variability, or maybe it's because we just don't have any idea biologically of what that molecule does that is associated with the disease or some, you know, sort of, of mechanism that led up to it. And so the interpretation of models is something we did hear about this morning, but I'll, I'll get into more as really a challenge and an essential component of using machine learning approaches for biomarker discovery. Interpretation. Um, you know, for biologists who generate a lot of this data and then work with clinicians to be able to deploy these biomarkers, again, we need to be able to understand the context that markers may work together to have the, be part of that disease mechanism that leads to the outcome. And what we know now is that rarely is there going to be a single marker that's going to work for any disease across a population and very likely need to be a panel of markers that are going to capture maybe the multitude of pathways that lead up to an event that causes disease. So we need explainable models. You know, we need models where we're not just training data, running through our machine learning, identifying the markers, and then we can't answer the questions of, why did you select that particular marker? Maybe we rank them based on some criteria, but you may get different rankings based on the different criteria that you use or based on the different model you used. Um, what's your confidence in that prediction, right? I mean, we, we talk about uncertainty a lot. Um, maybe we should turn that around and talk about it as confidence. What's our confidence in that marker? Um, and, and what part of that model breaks down? And when that model breaks down, what can you learn from that model when it fails? Um, and then when it does fail, how can you correct that, right? So a traditional um, machine learning approach for biomarker discovery really doesn't consider that because it looks at it in this black box approach. 
So what we really need are explainable models where we do our feature selection, you know, as was suggested this morning, with subsets of features that have some biological plausibility related to a mechanism or a disease state. A lot of the omics data types can be hypothesis generation tools that can give you new ideas for what's important, so you don't have to just look under the lamppost for what you already knew was important, but you can expand your knowledge of that by collecting these data. But you can also reduce that data down into something that you can explain physiologically of why that would be important for your disease state. And that's what will help you gain that confidence if you understand how you made those selections, if you understand why those markers are important, and um, you can really kind of open up that black box um, that leads to that prediction. So the current research that we're working on in um, integrative data and interpretable machine learning really focuses on identifying features that work in combination across multiple omics data types and data sets um, and the metadata that can predict disease um, or an exposure versus a control state. Um, what this involves is integrating machine learning approaches that account for the diversity and disparity across the multiple data types um, in combination with feature selection approaches that can really model the uncertainty within a data set. So I'm going to provide a couple of examples um, for how we're working on this. Um, one example is in the diabetes area. So there are several um, long-term clinical studies that are going on funded by NIH to study diabetes in children. Um, the first one is the DAISY study. This is diabetes um, autoimmunity study in the young that follows several high-risk children with diabetic relatives, follows them over their lifespan, and collects a lot of different data from samples longitudinally in these children to be able to see which ones develop diabetes, which ones don't, and can you retrospectively figure out which ones would have once you have that information. Um, combined with that is the TEDI study. This is the environmental determinants of diabetes in the young. And so this is actually a paired study that is getting at environmental exposures and environment for these children. This study has screened over 400,000 children across Europe and America and is following over 8,000 that are at the highest risk. And so this study will also provide more information about environment that may be contributing to diabetes. And then there's the HERN network. Um, this, this network is studying more of the islet cell biology to get at the cellular level response of islet cells to immune factors, to chemicals, and doing multi-omics and single cell imaging of islets to understand how they respond to their environment. So if you think about collecting these data types across different populations, different stages of development, as well as different types of clinical and um, biological samples from experiments, you can start to develop maybe a more comprehensive picture about the development of diabetes and the population sort of variability. So as we've worked with the collaborators um, in these studies through our, our funded programs, um, we've identified biomarker panels that can dif differentiate control groups from diabetic groups prior to the onset of clinical symptoms. And so this is really, I think, sort of the holy grail for this community to figure out which children are going to develop diabetes before they develop diabetes so that they can be monitored very, very closely, and then figuring out what is the what is actually leading to that so that we can get at prevention. And so that really will be the next phase for us of you know, really pulling apart the markers that have been put into these models, using a lot of recursive feature elimination to get to features that are highly predictive, but also peeling apart these markers to understand which ones are highly predicted but predicting have the same predictive power as each other so that we can get at some uniqueness and really start to tease apart the different and multitude of mechanisms that are responsible for the development of diabetes in young children. So another example that we've, we've studied is um, Ebola um, infection. So we have collaborators who were involved in sampling in the Ebola treatment units in 2014 in West Africa. And what they were doing is looking at patients walking into the Ebola treatment unit, collecting blood samples upon admission, 
and then every couple of days until they were discharged or um, they succumbed to the infection. And the goal of our study at that time was really to try to understand what makes some people more susceptible to the infection than others. And so we've collected genomics and proteomics, metabolomics and lipidomics um, on these samples and looked at the data. And what was interesting about this study was, um, and it's a very small study, obviously, so um, we've been cross-referencing this now with other publicly available data coming out of that, that outbreak is to look at the, the patients that survived versus those that succumbed to the infection. Um, we actually could, from the very first sample of them walking into the Ebola treatment unit, distinguish the survivors from the non-survivors. And that's really important in an environment like West Africa and the Ebola treatment units because they don't have the resources available to treat everybody with all of the drugs and all of the care that you might have available to us in, in the United States, but they need to be able to triage patients and say, which ones are likely to survive? We can give them palliative care and put them over here. Which ones are more likely to succumb and they need survivor serum, they need other treatments, um, drug treatments that can help them survive and um, overcome the infection? And largely what we saw um, from the analysis was that um, we had these markers that perfectly separated our fatalities from the survivors. But what was very interesting about those markers is that we had subsets of markers. The most predictive ones were the metabolites and the lipids that we measured in the serum. And that told us a lot about the metabolic state of these patients and that they really were succumbing to infection like you would see a patient with sepsis. And we could learn a lot about the biology of these markers to get at some hypotheses about how you might treat these people in a different way. So, for example, in West Africa, a lot of them are nutritionally challenged anyway. So many of the markers we identified really spoke to some nutritional deficiency for which if you could overcome that, potentially you could increase their chances of survival. Um, we could identify markers of apoptosis and autophagy um, that you know really get to some indications of the physiological and cellular breakdown that's happening with the infections, um, and and overall think about you know how we could supplement and treat these patients that are in the clinic. So the last example I want to provide is something that we're really just embarking on right now. Um, so I don't have any data to show you, but. Um, taking this step back from individual disease states and individual um, exposures, thinking about our first responder and even military populations that are in deployed environments. Um, if, you, if you think about 9-11, right, was a really great example of a population of first responders that have had a lot of lasting and long-term health consequences of being in that environment when it happened. Um, our firemen are in those environments almost every day. Our military in deployed areas are in that environment every day. And so what we're interested in is really understanding what is the influence of human genetics um, and the exposures on their health and their performance in a deployed environment. Um, when do you need to pull them out? Um, and so our focus is really in on identifying mechanisms and biomarkers of chemical impacts on their health and performance and mechanism and biomarkers of stress and fatigue in these populations. And so the way that we're approaching this is we're working with, with collaborators that are studying first responders, such as firemen in Los Angeles, as well as, as deployed environments, um, working with um, the Joint Base Lewis McCord and the US Air Force to understand you know, where they put, they are starting to use monitors of physiological measures of stress on their deployed individuals and then collecting samples for which we would do our multiomics profiling looking at both the physiological response as well as the exposome where we have the chemical markers available to do it quantitative. We're also working on more untargeted analyses so that we can get maybe a more global picture of everything that might be there. And, and our approach is to use machine learning to identify the genes that control susceptibility in these populations where we can, 
using deep learning algorithms to be able to predict mechanisms of toxicity because we have this multitude um, of chemistries involved in the exposures. And then artificial intelligence is really where it's important to start deciphering the influence um, of circadian rhythms and background variability on toxicity, resilience, um, and that sort of thing in these populations. And so just quickly, um, you know, I wanted to kind of hit on and distinguish between what we've been talking about machine learning as a subset of artificial intelligence capabilities, but where artificial intelligence really will enable us to sense and reason, act and adapt in an individual. And that's where I think we see the future and where we really see that people's trust in artificial intelligence is going to require opening the black box so that you can understand and have transparency into understanding the decision-making process, understanding the reasoning, and really getting your mathematical certainty wrapped around the predictions. Um, and so with that, you know, just summarizing, I think single biomarkers are really unlikely, so the integration is really important. Um, understanding uncertainty is a necessity. You have to account for individual variability and baseline dynamics. Um, interpretability and transparency of the models is really essential. And artificial intelligence is going to be key to the success and deployment of wearable sensors, which is really where the field is going. So with that, thank you.